Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 98 of the podcast. And today I'm going to talk about fear, how to get fear out of your way so you can work on the projects you most want to create. And this is exactly what I have been struggling with this week. Uh, last week, I gave myself permission to quit a project that I had been working on for months and begin working on the goddess quilt book that I have been wanting to write and create for many years. And of course, the very next thing that happened was I kind of got stuck uh, and I got locked in place from fear uh, and just feeling like, you know, I guess I kind of built it up so much for so long that now all of a sudden when I have a green light to go and make that thing I've been wanting to make, uh, that feels really hard. And so I, it's been a slow progression of just kind of working my way through it, first identifying it and then working my way through it. And I have lots of different tips and ideas to share with you guys this week. And yeah, I just wanted to share in this journey because uh, you know, the process of creating this is going to be an evolution in and of itself. So I love the opportunity to be able to share that with you. Uh, but that's going to be coming up later on in all of my podcast episodes. I always share what I'm really working on behind the scenes uh, and, uh, you know, what's going on around the house. And I am still working on my pregnant goddess quilt. And you can see I have basted her to the background. This is the beautiful piece of purple uh, Dupioni silk that is on her background. I did put her on the long arm and do that stitching, but I heard from someone this week uh, in comments on YouTube just about how um, basting could leave lines on the quilt. And I have seen this just a little bit with one of my quilts. And that was enough for me to go, what, you know, wait a minute, I, let's maybe wait on the batting getting involved. So all I did was put the background fabric on the long arm. I stretched, didn't really stretch it necessarily, but I just got it on the long arm where it was nice and flat and up on the rollers. And then I spread out the uh, applique that I'd already done. And I had already noticed that there was a little bit of funny fabric stuff going on in the goddess's belly. She's a pregnant goddess. So she's got a nice big belly. And uh, there's just a little bit of ripply fabric going on. And I think a lot of that had to do with whenever I was first starting to do the applique process, that is where I started. I started right there in the center. Uh, and her arm especially, I remember putting that onto freezer paper and then pulling it off two or three times which means it probably distorted ever so slightly. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the things that you begin with sometimes end up being the parts that, you know, where you fussed with it, where you had an issue, at least for me, where I, where I have fought with the design or where I fought with the process, that area usually comes back to bite me, not once, not twice, but through the entire process. And that is the case. Uh, I, I noticed that kind of puddly fabric I'm aware of it. It might simply be that particular color of Dupioni silk. It's kind of this teal blue color. I noticed some rippliness in other places too where I had not fussed and fought with it. So it could be just simply that fabric is wanting to go loosey-goosey. Maybe it wasn't starched as much as the other. I don't really know. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of one of those things that I just, I'm aware of the problem and I got the quilt as flat as I could to the background. Uh, my plan here is just to continue hand applique and get both of these long lines of uh, blue stitched down to the background. And then I'm probably going to end up clipping away uh, all of the background fabric that's in, you know, underneath, that's underneath the goddess. And the reason for that is just, I think it will help it spread out and lay flatter. Uh, this is going to be a wall hanging, definitely. So I want it to hang as flat and true as possible. I might end up steaming the top which might help, you know, to kind of flatten everything out. I don't know. You know, it's, it's one of those things that I'm continually reminded by. Even now, I started quilting in 2005. So uh, 14 plus years of quilting experience, I'm still learning new things and I'm still making quilts that <laughs> remind me that I don't really know what I'm doing, <laughs> you know? And it's kind of fun because 
uh, you know, it, it's good to have that reminder that there's still more to learn. There's still more to know. And that, you know, at any given time, you can get a piece of fabric that just doesn't want to behave like everybody else does. And, uh, and it just wants, you know, it's just like a, it's a, a little reminder that, you know, hey, there's, there's more to this than you think. And I like that. Sometimes I need that little reminder. Maybe it kind of takes me off my high horse a little bit. And that's good. You know, the second that I start thinking that I got it all figured out is the second that I need to be reminded that I don't have it all figured out. <laughs> so this has been fun. And um, I will be honest, I have not actually spent very much time hand appliqueing. Uh, because I have finally gotten my Singer 15 clone going. It's got a belt on it. It is piecing. And so in the evening, I have been puttering around with that and piecing a bit. It's not this treadle. It's the treadle I've got in the house. And I love it. Uh, it's so much fun to stitch on. And I've been stitching on that whenever James and I have been watching an Andy Griffith episode in the evening. So that's what I've been mostly focusing on during that time. And I'm going to, I'm basically kind of challenging myself to um, piece a patchwork, a very small patchwork quilt completely on that treadle and then to quilt it on the treadle too. I think I'll probably turn that into a hoop quilt. So it's just been a fun little tangent, mostly to build skill on that treadle. And it was, it was a learning curve to realize, you know, there's more than just one reason not to go with a super, super old treadle. I mean, this one was probably built in, you know, 1890 to 1900, but that's still a lot earlier than the Singer 12, which I, you know, that was the, the treadle and the treadle base that I had in the house. Uh, that one might have been as early as uh, 1875 to 1880. And that is, you know, they were still working out the kinks. They were still working out the manufacturing and, and figuring out what people wanted and what worked really, really well. So it was almost too early. Uh, and I did not realize that. Uh, of course, I had been cautioned. <laughs> but, you know, whenever somebody tells you, you know, that might be a little bit too old, you know, the instant reaction is, well, how, why? And then if they don't have a good explanation for it, it's easy to run off and go and buy that thing anyway. And it, that Singer 12 was definitely an impulse buy. I found it for 65 bucks in an antique mall and I was bound and determined that that was gonna be my first treadle. So what I did not know is that the base has a very small wheel on it. And you might be able to see, probably not in the shot, but my wheel on this Singer 27 is much bigger. It's about that big around. The one on the Singer 12 was only about that big. And what I didn't realize is that means it's gonna be so much more work to get it going. So for every pedal back and forth, I only take three stitches on that machine versus at least a dozen on this machine, you know? And so that's just the difference of how it feels like I'm doing a workout <laughs> on that treadle cabinet versus this one. So that has been, you know, it's it's just been a, lot, a nice learning curve. Again, you know, learning that I don't know as much as I think I do. That's always nice. And uh, even, be, even though it's a little bit more of a workout, I'm still really enjoying it. Uh, now that base also has a cracked pitman. A pitman is the wooden rod that uh, basically drives the wheel. Uh, it connects to the base where your feet are. And then uh, the pitman is what kind of connects that, the place where your feet rest to the wheel and turns it. Uh, and so the pitman on that base was cracked. And so it's adding a good bit of play into the treadle. So as I'm treadling back and forth, I'm kind of hearing this rattly, rattly, rattly noise. And it feels like it's a feeling thing that I would never have been able to pick up. I would never have known any of this a year ago. I think it's so fascinating uh, that there's just this little bit of play in it that makes it sometimes hard to get started when I'm piecing. It's hard to get started because of that little bit of play in the, in the foot pedal. And so I went and looked up and measured the pitman to see if I could replace it. And of course, it's a very weird length. So it's like not just one thing, you know, I've given up on the machine. Just this week, I posted a video on how I took out the Singer 12 and I put in a beautiful teal blue Stradivario Singer 15 clone, a Japanese made machine that would fit. And I cut out the treadle base to make it fit. So I've now replaced the machine. 
I'm going to probably replace the Pittman if I can find another, uh, another one to go there. And if I can't, then I might replace the irons completely too. In which case, you know, it's like, what is going to actually be left <laughs> of the original Singer cabinet that I bought? Well, the cabinet, I really, I, and I'm really proud of the job that I did refinishing the tabletop. And um, I didn't fully refinish the drawers. I just kind of, I was in a hurry and I really needed to get them out of the barn. And I really needed to get the drawers on the table because uh, I needed the storage space right there. Also, the drawers on this particular cabinet, that is what supports the drop leaf. Uh, it only had a drop, a, like a partial drop leaf, and that was supported by uh, a little piece of wood that came out of the edge of the drawers. So I needed to have that done. So I didn't finish the drawers nearly as nice as I did the tabletop. I didn't seal them with, you know, several coats of lacquer or anything like that. But it's good enough, you know, and I'm happy with it. I'm really, really pleased with the job I did. And it's certainly in a lot better shape than what it was when I found it in the antique mall. It was filthy. It was covered in rust. The tabletop was in bad shape. You know, I really feel like I greatly improved this machine. But I might end up actually changing the treadle base as well. I might change out the irons and go with a different set of irons and and take the irons that are on it right now and maybe put them outside and build a concrete tabletop and have that be an outdoor table. So, you know, I figure, hey, I, I bothered to get it all rust free. <laughs> now I can stick it back out in my yard and let it rust because <laughs> it's my choice, right? Uh, so, yeah, it's just been one of those fun things. And there's so much knowledge that I feel like I've gained from this experience and knowing more about the treadle bases and what to look for and you know just the difference in the wheel I mean something that I just absolutely had no clue about whatsoever uh, but it I, you know it makes a lot of sense the bigger the wheel the more revolutions which means the more you're going to drive the belt which means the less you got to pedal and the more stitches you're going to make but I would not have understood any of that if I hadn't had the experience. So I'm really happy for that. So yeah, I've been puttering around with that project. I have not made any progress with Miss Bunny. I'm really wanting to do something fun for Easter. And so I've kind of been stuck between working on the Miss Bunny that's just like the general, you know, Miss Bunny uh, as I wrote her in Mally the Maker, uh, that doll, and you know, in her dusky pink calico dress and then wanting to do something really special for Easter. So I've been kind of caught between those two desires and I need to just sit down and muscle through the work. It's just a lot of detailed computer work and slow clicking around on Illustrator, which is boring. And uh, I'll be honest, I'm just not really in the mood to do it right now. Uh, usually what I'll do when I'm, I'm doing a lot of Illustrator work, it's I like it to be pretty nasty outside. I like it to be rainy and wet and, and cold. And I like to turn on Vampire Diaries, which is a show I've watched so many times that I can just listen to it. So I turn that on and I just have it kind of playing in the background because it's got good music. And I listen to that while I'm focusing on Illustrator and kind of go in my zone uh, and get, you know, knock out a lot of work at one time. Whenever I'm doing design work on a book or something like that, I'll just, you know, I'll watch several seasons uh, over the course of several weeks. And, and that's kind of my habit. I really enjoy that, but I've just not been in the mood for it lately. Uh, and I've been so busy with working on the goddess book. And I'm going to share more about that in the podcast itself. But I gotta say, I received so many nice comments and emails last week from last week's podcast. And this is just a lesson to, to not be so hard on ourselves because I will be honest I was one click away I am not kidding when I say I was one click away from deleting all of last week's podcast I came so close to it because I started judging it uh, I I had hay fever last week and it definitely was hay fever I was loopy <laughs> And I'll, I'll be honest, I, I listened to the podcast. And I was like, oh man, you know, I just started beating myself up for it. You know, this is so loopy and I didn't need, I was, I was disjointed and it didn't make a lot of sense. And I just started really being hard on myself about it. 
And I came so close to deleting that episode rather than sharing it, even though I had, you know, been honest and shared that, you know, hey guys, I'm not feeling all that well. And, and, you know, kind of came out and said that. So it was, it was obvious that I wasn't top of my game, but I still felt like, ah, you know, there's no excuse that, you know, I could have made this so much better. And I had some other mental revelations about that topic later on. And I was like, oh, I can go shoot this. I can make it so much better. Well, that whole chasing so much better is a rabbit hole in and of itself. It's a dangerous rabbit hole. And it's one of those things that I've, you know, a lot of times when I do delete something and go and shoot it all over again, it's not really that much better. It's maybe 5% better, you know, and is that even a noticeable quantity? And is that worth going and reshooting something all the way from scratch and trying to remember what, what I've said and what I haven't said and what I said before and, it just becomes a really crazy mess. Um, but what's interesting is just how many comments and positive feedback I received from last week's podcast in spite of it not being perfect and in spite of the fact that I nearly deleted it. So I wanted to share a couple of these comments with you because they really did make my day. So Vivian N said, thank you for this podcast. Giving yourself permission to drop a project and pursue one you are passionate about makes so much sense. We get so bogged down in our own little laws that we waste time and steal our joy. I'm excited about giving myself permission to let go of some projects so I can start the ones I long to do. And I love that. You know, it's it's so important to pursue the projects that actually feel important to make. And, uh, you know, just piecing something together just to use up fabric, you know, it just, that just doesn't feel the same as piecing something like that Lone Star quilt. We started a conversation on uh, the Quilt Friends Club this week. Uh, somebody posted, Eric posted a beautiful picture of a Lone Star and it just made me start thinking like a Lone Star has been on my list for many, many years. Like when am I going to make myself a Lone Star? And it's so easy to go and make something quick and simple, you know, like my, uh, my stack and slash four patch or a disappearing nine patch or anything like that. You know, those quilts are so, so easy. They don't make you work for it, you know, and you know, going back to rise to the challenge, you know, the challenge, what is the challenge? The challenge is going after the project that is harder the going after the project that because it's harder, it means more. It's like, you know, wow, I made that double wedding ring I've been wanting to make since I got married. Josh and I just celebrated this past weekend our 14th wedding anniversary. I still don't have a double wedding ring on my bed. <laughs> so, you know, it's one of those things to think about what challenges that we are avoiding rather than seeking in even in our quilting, you know, uh, and, and sometimes I really feel like traditional quilting patterns were designed to be hard. I mean, they were designed so that you showed off your skill with the intricate piecing or the intricate applique or the intricate combination of the two. And that was the whole point. It was not to do it quick and simple. It was not to make a quilt in a day or a weekend. It was so that you had an heirloom to pass on that was the ultimate testament to your skill. And I think that's super, super important. Uh, so got another uh, comment from Fee Quilts. Uh, she said, uh, you know, she shared quite a long uh, comment just about uh, making a quilt. It was a 3D Viking shield quilt and uh, she had put it away because it had a lot of complexity and it was very difficult to piece. Uh, and then now she's pulled it back out again and she's working on it again. She's filled it with symbolism and that she would never have done before. And she's named it now Protect Your Heart. And she also recommended a YouTube channel from surviving to thriving. It's been very excellent for her. And, uh, you know, she kind of felt like putting it away was good, it sounds like, but bringing it back out and getting back to that project after taking that break is super important too. And I'll be completely honest, you know, it, sometimes we take something on and it's too much, you know, whether it's just, oh my gosh, this, this double wedding room is, is just too difficult. It's beyond my skill level right now. I cannot do it right now. I don't have time. There's too many other projects in my way. You know, this feels rushed. All of those are great reasons to set something aside, but then it, you know, when it's time to return, when your plate is clearer, 
then it's time to return and, and retake that challenge and go back to it. And I think often having that break and building that skill is absolutely essential. When you get back to it, then everything goes much easier, but it is still going to be a challenge. That is the whole point. At no point should it feel like as simple as a walk in the park. That's this is not gonna happen. <laughs> it's quilting, it's gonna be hard, right? Uh, so we have another comment from Miss Natty. She said, uh, she'd been thinking about this a lot lately as she's working on finishing many UFOs as possible to clear space, especially those that ha have been laying around for years, normally with just the last finishing touches to go. And I still, she still really, really wants to finish, this though, finish those quilts. I used to have so much guilt over the money, the time invested, the environmental reasons, etc., about UFOs, but she's become much better about letting go of the guilt. Uh, she lets herself turn the fabric and yarns into something else or pass it on to someone else. That is always freeing uh, when you're ready to let it go. Uh, but what I do to finish projects I want to do is to set myself some rules around not starting new ones before I finish the project she's on right now. So I think rules are really good. I, I really think that that's excellent because when you set yourself some guidelines where it's like, okay, I've got to get through this difficult project. I'm not allowed to make something else until this is done. I think that's excellent because then it's like, you know, you might be craving that cookie, that, <laughs> that super, super simple thing, but you're not allowed to have that, you know, that easy, fast, quick kind of, um, instant gratification until you get through the hard stuff. And I think that's great. Uh, and one last question, and this was actually completely not part of the podcast at all, but it was a great question. Uh, and this was posted by Dorleen S. And she asks, is there any way to add a mitered border to a quilt as you go quilt? And here's the thing that's interesting uh, about that question and the reason why I decided to share it. So I've shared lots and lots of videos on quilt as you go over the years. And to be honest, you know, quilt as you go in itself is a rather niche topic. You know, you're quilting things separately and then you're putting it all together again. And I've really only ever shared the one technique that I use the most. And it's because I use it the most that I share that one the most. <laughs> uh, but her question is, you know, hey, mitered border to a quilt. And my instant reaction is, why bother? You know, my, I kind of look at, let's keep it simple, you know, and a mitered border on a quilt is challenging in the first place, just by itself, a mitered border is more complicated than a squared off border. Uh, and so my initial re response is just kind of like, you know, maybe simplify your design idea rather than going after the hardest, hardest thing. Well, uh, she commented again and said, you know, hey, I'm really, I've really been stuck on a project I really want to finish, but I don't, I don't want to finish it with a different type of border. I'm really stuck on this. I really, really want this mitered border. And so I thought about it some more and said, well, you don't, there's no YouTube video. No one has done a video on this. No one has, has figured this out yet. So this is basically uncharted territory. So the solution is to give yourself permission to go invent the technique whatever it is. And you're going to have to experiment. You're going to have to rise to the challenge of the difficulty. It's not going to be easy. It, there's no game plan. There's a, you know, there's methods of putting stuff together. Sure. But as far as putting it together, plus adding that diagonal 45 degree seam. Yeah. You're on your own <laughs> basically. And this is the thing, like, you know, watching YouTube videos will only get you so far. If you want to do something very niche and different and weird, you know, it requires experimentation. It really, really does. And that is your own adventure. And look at it that way, rather than looking for the right way and the wrong way, look at, okay, I've got an idea. I'm going to go experiment with it. I'm going to go try this. I'm going to go figure this out, or I'm going to go answer one question about it and then pursue that. And I'll be honest, it's messy. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna stumble down paths that, you know, and techniques that totally don't work. You know, oh, well, gluing binding on the surface work. I don't know. You know, will piecing it work? I don't know. You know, it's every single thing is a question. Every single thing presents a possibility. And then every single thing must be tried. And not just once, you know, it's one thing to say, okay, hey, it worked in this one quilt but will it work when it's a 16 inch wide border? <laughs> you know, when, it, when you take it to extremes, will that technique work? When you test it something at a four inch, 
you know, little block, it's going to maybe work one way. When you test something on a 16 inch wide border on a 90 inch wide quilt, it's going to be a very different situation. So, you know, this is one of those situations that, you know, sometimes as a teacher, I do push back. And, and the reason is I don't really have the same interest. I'm not interested in pursuing a mitered border with a quilt as you go quilt. That takes a lot of dedication, number one. And it's just not something that I'm really interested in. So in this case, as a teacher, I push back to my student and say, go figure this out yourself. It's okay to go experiment and go learn this yourself and to go challenge that idea and figure out what works. And then you learn something that I don't know how to do, that probably no one really knows how to do or no one has a real game plan for. And then that's something that you can then publish or share or teach and, and share that with the world. And I think that's amazing. So uh, I think that there's so many ways of looking at permission to make these projects that we want to make. And I know that, you know, what I shared last week was just the tip of the iceberg. And, uh, you know, kind of one of the ideas that I had after I filmed that whole loopy podcast <laughs> was just how everything that we learn is like a class for what we make next. So as much as I wrote of the book, you know, before Rise to the Challenge of Your Life, I wrote 45,000 words of a book that I then decided to shelve. Well, that was basically like taking a super intensive two month long class on memoir writing. And I, I passed the class. I wrote the memoir. Do I need to publish it? No. You know, do we need to publish term papers that come out of English classes in college? No. You know, so it's kind of like looking at it as the class needed to get to the next level. So in that way, some projects, you know, if a project helped teach you half square triangles, for example, but then now you have no desire to piece another, you know, 2 million half square triangles to finish that project, well, then you are allowed to set that aside or just simply finish it in the smaller baby quilt that it is right now, rather than making 2 million more half square triangles to make it exactly the way the pattern dictated. Uh, you know, so I hope that this, I hope this makes sense and that that whole topic is still kind of, I'm still munching on it. I'm still working on it because I think that this is a lot bigger than I expected. Uh, you know, and it was kind of, for me, it was mostly just like when I come up with a topic, sometimes it's just like, all right, what am I struggling with this week? You know, what am I dealing with that I can share about that will help me get through this and get to the next level? Because I'm, I'll be honest, guys, I'm still figuring this stuff out as I go too. Uh, and I think it's wonderful. This is why I love the podcast so much and continue to do it because I find it so beneficial for this kind of thing. Uh, and I think if I didn't have the um, push to share something and talk about something every single week, then it would be very easy. And I know in the past it was very easy to stagnate. Sorry, I'm rattling things around. I, I needed to get more thread out. Uh, so it's very easy to stagnate and to stay stuck in a particular place for long periods of time unless I have the, you know, kind of need to share it. I know that I would probably have taken a lot longer on the applique of this goddess quilt that I'm working on if I didn't have the, uh, the push to show some progress on it every single week. And this is, you know, the thing, uh, you can start using systems in your life like that, whether it's a guild meeting, you know, having the show and tell of a guild meeting to get up and, and show your progress on a project, or it's, you know, blog posts or social media posts or a podcast of your own, then that gives you the, um, that gives you the push to keep things going and keep things moving and not get stuck. And stuck is definitely going to be something I'm going to be talking about here in just a second. <laughs> You know, that's definitely been one of those things on my mind. Now, this coming week, we start a new month, and this is our fifth block for the Friendship Sampler Quilt Along. This is called Scrap Overload, and I think it earned that name. <laughs> definitely. Lots and lots of half square triangles, lots of little pieces, and this crazy border. I absolutely love this block. So you'll be able to find the pattern for this at leahday.com slash friendship on April 1st. And that happens to be a Monday, so I will also be sharing 
the video on how to piece it that same day. So you'll be able to get your block and get started immediately piecing it together. Uh, and this one was pretty complicated. So yeah, you'll want to get started early and knock out your units and then uh, start putting it together pretty quickly. Uh, and the reason why I shared this one early is just simply so if you fall behind, then you have it to work on through the summer. And a lot of the blocks through the summer are going to be simpler and faster to piece. So no worries there. I I absolutely love the Friendship Quilt Along for how scrappy and, and it's kind of like a almost like a memory, um, a time capsule, pulling out all of my scraps and seeing all those fabrics again on the blocks has been, it's like, I, I see a, a piece of fabric and I'm like, oh, I remember designing that, or oh, I remember buying that, you know, on a trip or something like that. So it's really been special. And I hope that it's been the same for you too, and brought back lots of fond memories of when you purchased all the fabrics in your stash. So one last update, I got a lot of work done this weekend on my rabbit hutch and I'm really excited about it. I learned a lot about, I've learned a lot about building from this experience. I mean, I knew a lot already, but this has really helped. It's really helped me to start looking at designs and, and building the plan of construction more. And what, what's been interesting too, is I've used a lot of scrap wood on this project. And of course that's been a little challenging because a lot of that scrap wood wasn't in all that great a shape. So I've had a great time putting this together and then uh, learned about some plastic roofing panels that can also be used to turn to make greenhouses. Uh, when you get the clear variety, I got the opaque variety for the roof. And so I, my next project is gonna be a little greenhouse that I've had, I had this kind of, um, it's like a, a pump for my well and I'm no longer on using it. I'm no longer using the well because we have city water. And it's kind of basically like a, a little brick foundation. And I realized I could build a greenhouse right on top of that. And I actually need to do something there anyway because the roof over it is rotted out. So I'm kind of the type of person where when I see something could be improved, and then, you know, hey, I'm gonna need to replace that anyway. I kind of use that as a justification <laughs> for running down with a whole other major project. Yeah, not Josh's favorite thing about me, but we have a lot of fun and I have had a great time putting this rabbit hutch together. And I'm hoping I'm gonna kind of combine what I've built with cages. I'm thinking I'll be able to fit eight bunnies. So that's really exciting. And then I might have room for some expansion because you know, rabbits. <laughs> All right, so uh, think, super special thank you to everyone that joined the uh, Quilt Friends Club. This is our membership club where you can make friends with quilters around the world. Uh, you can share beautiful pictures of your quilts and you can participate in the How Do I Quilt This series. Basically, when you uh, post a picture of a quilt that you're struggling to know how to quilt it, and then once a month, I take all of the quilt images and I share three different quilting design ideas. And this month we had 12 quilts. It was almost a two hour long video, but it was, it was a marathon, it really was. But I had so much fun sharing this and it's really, it's helping me build design skill. And I came up with some designs. I was like, ah, I wanna make that quilt. <laughs> you know, I really wanna make that now. Uh, and there's just such a wide variety of beautiful quilt tops out there. And it's just been so fascinating to see all of the different tops that are posted. So if that sounds like something that you would like to be a part of, come and check out this Quilt Friends Club at quiltfriends.club. And a super special thank you to Denise Lawrence, Maggie O'Connell Guys, Kay Brothel, Donna Christensen, Sheila Lambert, Gina Childs, Sazzy Felstein, and Don Planky. Thank you guys for joining in the group this month and I cannot wait to see your beautiful quilts. So that's it for the news around the house and now we're gonna talk about getting fear out of the way of a very special project. So I think the very first step when it comes to fear is identifying it. And this can be tricky. Uh, I'll be honest, what happened first when I kind of gave myself permission to work on this book uh, is 
I just started avoiding it. And it was for a whole host of reasons that all sounded really good. You know, first off, I wasn't feeling well, and that, that gave me a, a perfect excuse to sleep late and not get my writing time in and, you know, and just kind of skive off a little bit, you know, um, just kind of take it easy and cut myself slack. So that's what, how it first started up. And I let myself, you know, get away with that for a good couple of days. And then I started to wonder, huh, is there something else going on here? You know, is there, is, am I really feeling that bad that I can't, you know, wake up at six o'clock in the morning the way I have for the last two years in a row and take James to the bus stop and then go and get my writing time in. Like, what is the deal? That is my habit. That is an established, built habit that I don't even have to think about anymore. But all of a sudden, I was struggling to get out of bed and get my work done. So uh, I, how I sort through this kind of stuff and how I work through a lot of things is stream of consciousness journaling. Uh, I open a blank word document. I I will be honest, I do not like to hand write. I know a lot of uh, advice for artists and stuff, like the artist way, um, the advice is to hand write out three pages in the morning. And I'll be honest, that gives me a hand cramp within one or two pages. And I really am very careful about my hands. Obviously, I want to save my hands for hand stitching and, you know, for things like that. Uh, and I just don't feel like that's a productive use of my hands to hand write out a journal entry. That's just my opinion. And I really found that when I, when I got stuck on that and I made myself hand write everything, it wasn't useful. It just made me irritable. <laughs> so yeah, I open a Word document because that is what works for me. And I just start writing whatever my thoughts are. And that is whatever is in my thought, whether it is I am tired and sleepy and kind of crabby today. And I really hope no one gets in my way because I'm going to tear their head off. You know, whatever it is that's up there just needs to get out and get on the page. So that way I can actually view it, identify it and work on it when it's all nebulous and kind of hiding in the dark and I don't really know what's going on, then it's really easy to get stuck and stay stuck because I'm not even aware of why I'm stuck. You know, I was just avoiding working on the book and avoiding getting my writing time in. And I could have left it that way for a week or two or months. You know, I could have stayed stuck like that and wasted the entire rest of the year, just like, oh, I just don't feel like it, and make some excuses, that kind of thing, and not checked in on what was actually going on. Uh, so it was pretty quick when I started stream of consciousness journaling, <laughs> just how terrified I was of writing this book. And I think a lot of this has to do with just building it up so much. You know, I've, I've wanted to write about my Goddess Quilt series. This is a series I started in 2007. Um, I've shared podcast episodes about these quilts, so you can go and find those. They're very special to me. They really, really are. And then it also, you know, it's, I've built up what I want to share in that book. I've built up the techniques behind the quilts. I've built up uh, shooting pretty photos of the quilts and having lots of, of gorgeous uh, photos of the quilting and of the quilts and, you know, everything to go with that. And so I've made it so big and so monstrous in my head that it was very hard to take the first step and start writing those stories uh, without just immediately crashing into a wall of judgment. And, you know, that's not helpful for anything. It's not helpful for making a quilt. You know, if, if the very first thing you do when you sit down at your sewing machine is start criticizing your stitches, you know, if you begin free motion quilting and then you start agonizing about every missed stitch, about every, you know, time you wobbled, you're not going to stitch very long before you just quit, take off that foot and go back to piecing. Uh, you know, we, our minds don't particularly like to get beaten up, you know, and, and criticized and to suffer that kind of continual judgment. And what I recognized pretty quickly is uh, I had written... I kind of had stopped and started this book so many times over the years that I had written a good chunk of certain stories and then kind of stopped and left them. And then now I, I, what I, what I immediately began when I, when I gave myself permission to work on this book is I immediately went to those stories and began editing. I had been editing on the challenge book 
That's what I had been working on for the last two plus weeks. And so I immediately went into editing mode on the goddess book, even though really I should have just started over from scratch. I should have just started over from absolute blank canvas, blank page scratch and gone from there. Uh, and, and this is the danger of starting and stopping and starting and stopping is that whenever you finally give yourself permission to make the thing and to see it all the way through to the end, it can be very hard to know, do you begin at the middle where you left it the last time or do you start all over again from scratch and which is the better way? And I don't have an answer for that. I think that's going to be different for every single project. Um, but with this one, I decided I'm right. I'm going to, I'm going to finish editing this one story. And then most of the other stories, I'm going to take a look at what I've written or I take a look at my notes and I will probably start the rest of them from scratch. But, uh, my friend Katie, hi Katie. Uh, she sent me a absolutely perfect Instagram post that I needed to hear today. And, and this is like just the, the power of perfect connections that I think is just great. So this was posted by an Instagram uh, person called Chandra Trophe, and she said, resist the urge to edit as you write. There is a time for self-editing and revision, but it is not during your dedicated writing time. Why? Because each time you stop to second guess yourself, you stop the flow of creativity, and it takes approximately 20 minutes to get back into that creative flow. If you only have one hour of writing time set aside each day, you can't afford to break that flow because that's when your best writing emerges. That is exactly what I needed to hear. And I'm so happy that my friend sent me that Instagram post. And I'm so happy that Shonda Trophy posted that because that is so that is that is so brilliant and yes that is exactly the uh rabbit hole i was i was running down i was editing during my writing time when i should have been writing you know as far as i'm concerned the first story which is about life and fire that's the pregnant goddess quilt that i made first it was it was made in 2007 when i was pregnant with my son james I pretty much already written it it's already done you know that story is done i need to move on get to the next one and I need a rough draft this, which means write it. Just write it as dirty and awful and scary bad as it's going to be. And then trust the editing process, which it is a process. It's handing it off to Josh and let, letting Josh go through it with a red you know, pen. It's then taking it back myself and I go through it with a red pen. It's then listening to it. Uh, one chapter at a time and editing from listening. You know, it is a whole process in and of itself, but diving right into this thing with a critical hand and, you know, chopping at it and stuff like that, it was just, it was just not working. You know, and of course I didn't want to work on it because it was feeling so hard and, and not a lot of fun, you know? Um, so step one that I did was identify that I was afraid, you know? Okay. So that, fairly simple, but that's a potential to get stuck in for quite some time. I know in the past, particularly when I did not have the podcast as, you know, a daily check, sorry, weekly check-in uh, to, you know, know what I had accomplished in the last week and be able to say, here, I got this done or here, I got this, this much stitched or, or whatever it was. Um, I could stay stuck on something for years. I'm not kidding. I could stay stuck on a project for years and, and that was just not being aware enough of how much time was passing and not checking in on what was the most important thing to be working on at that particular time. So it can really happen. It can really seek up on you. So the next thing that I checked in on, and this was actually a funny thing this morning. Uh, I was laying in bed, <laughs> six o'clock in the morning. My alarm went off. It was time to get up. I needed to go start writing and... I was not motivated to get out of bed at all. And I started kind of beating myself up about it. Like, you know, you said you wanted to write this book. You've said you wanted to make this project. You've said you wanted to do this for years. You have a green light to do it. You have all this time. You know, what are you doing? <laughs> so, you know, my motivational speaker in my own head was kind of on overdrive. And then Lazy Leah, the, you know, the girl inside me that wasn't having it, that wanted to sleep late. Lazy Leah was just shrugging like, uh, yeah, whatever. I can finish that some other time. 
because I've put it off for so long, it is so hard to break out of that inertia because it feels like, oh, I can just, I can survive with that not being done another year. I can survive that not being done for another two years. I've survived this long with it not being done. So why not continue putting it off? That's, that's the dangerous side of inertia. So I was laying there and thinking, okay, well, what if instead of writing the goddess book, I was writing the next book for Mally the Maker instead? And Mally the Maker is, it's going to be a series. And I already know the plot of book two. So this is book one, uh, Mally the Maker and the Queen and the Quilt. And uh, I want to take Mally back into the world of quilts. She needs to go on another adventure and have lots of fun and get beaten up and <laughs> tortured. And she needs to stitch her way out of sticky situations and make new friends and make more quilts and all kinds of fun stuff. So I'm really excited about writing book two and I want to write book three uh, almost immediately after it. I'm probably going to kind of write I'm probably going to write both of those books back to back and then edit them so that way they come out fairly close together. And so as soon as I thought of Mally the Maker, I was like, yeah, I want to get out of bed and write Mally. You know, it was, it was easy to think about that. And the motivation was there because Mally feels easy. It feels like I don't, I don't, I know where the plot's going. I know what's happening next, but I basically realized I needed to restart the book. So it, it feels like a fresh start. And um, yeah, it just has, it had a very different feel to it in my head. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, both projects are in their infancy. Book two is in its infancy. I haven't started Mally book two really yet. I got, I got a lot done on it. Uh, I started writing that back in September and then I realized that a lot of what I had established, you know, it needed to be rewritten. I needed to retool things and really give readers what they want <laughs> at the beginning. I was kind of, I was doing something that I think a lot of readers would not like. Uh, and, and so I, I kind of checked in on that and, and reset my, my, um, my outline to fix that. But the goddess book is in the same state. It is in its infancy. I'm still in the figuring out what's going to be in this book, answering the question, is this going to just be a memoir? Is this going to be a technique book? Is this going to be a project book? Am I going to walk you through the steps of making a goddess step by step? In all honesty, I don't think so. I don't think there's going to be room for that, but I could definitely be a technique book where I explain the different techniques or just different skill builders. Like with each chapter, I have a skill builder with each chapter to kind of explain what the challenge was and then how to to work on that skill or how to test that technique such as like you know how to paint with shiva paint sticks that's what i did with the second goddess quilt i painted almost the whole surface with shiva paint sticks so i would love to have that be a technique that you learn in the goddess book so i'm still answering those questions so in almost every way this book is in its infancy just the same way mally book two is and as soon as I realized that, that finally motivated Lazy Leah. <laughs> uh, I was, it was, it was finally like, okay, I'm really copping out. I had to, I, that forced me to get honest with myself and say, wow, I'm really being lazy here. I'm really copping out. I'm really taking the easy path. I am really avoiding the challenge and, uh, and that's going to result in yet another year lived in regret. That's going to result in another year of not making this thing I've wanted to make for so long. And, you know, eventually there's going to come a point where it's like, I can't write that anymore, you know, or, um, or I die <laughs> before it's done or something like that. I mean, that's a little bit morbid, but still, you know, there's only so long something can get put off before it's just never going to happen. And, kind of tricking my brain that way and this might help you where if you think about the different projects that you've got and you think oh you know you got that difficult thing that you know you really your heart wants you to make your heart wants you to to finish but it's just so hard and it's gotten bogged down and it's gotten stuck and it's difficult and then you go and consider oh what about that you know super super easy fast you know jelly roll quilt and whenever you know that you're wanting to go, you know, peace and work on that easy thing, you need to kind of turn that into humor and laugh at yourself for avoiding the difficulty, you know, like you got to rise to the challenge of this stuff. If that's really what you want to make, if that's really what you want to create, 
get real with it, get honest about it and stop putting it off. That was really kind of, that helped me this morning a lot, you know, and it, I got out of bed. I, I stopped making excuses. I stopped hitting my alarm clock. I got out of bed and I got my two hours of writing time in. Now I did spend a good bit of that time editing because I had not yet received my uh, friend's comment from Instagram. So, you know, it's kind of, I think, I think things magically happen exactly as they're supposed to. And I know tomorrow morning I'm going to get started with my writing time and it's going to be writing, not editing. I'm going to stop editing and just write and then it'll be cleaning up and editing at the end once all of the text is done. Uh, so another thing, and this was, this was the last thing that I found really helpful. Uh, and, and what it was is I was looking at my rabbit hut, <laughs> which is, you know, Josh said, Josh's comment was it was built like an aircraft carrier. And I was like, look, this is just built the way a rabbit hutch is supposed to be built. We have arguments about the way things get built. Josh has cobbled together a chicken coop in, you know, from kind of uh, scrap materials that I disagree with. You know, I'm like, your chicken coop is ugly and awful. And that's not the way I would have built it. And his mentality is, well, it works. And it's not that big of a deal. You know, it just needs to, you know, be good enough to hold together and, and house my chickens and keep them safe from predators. And so I think, you know, and, and that's my temptation. My temptation is always to build something up and make it bigger and more complicated than it needs to be. Josh is uh, kind of what he always does is he always simplifies and cuts it down and makes it faster and quicker to finish. And, and so we're very good, you know, opposing forces with each other. We really are. We're very well balanced because he's always wanting to simplify and I'm always wanting to complicate. He's always wanting it to go fast. I'm always kind of going, oh, let's take our time. You know, let's, let's enjoy this process. And, uh, you know, and, and so we're, we're, we're well balanced in that way. And so I was looking at my rabbit hutch today and just thinking, you know, hey, you know, it probably, you know, could have been built a little bit lighter than what I did. It probably didn't need to be as souped up as I've made it. It probably didn't need as big a roof as I'm sticking on it. Uh, you know, but it's still, it's going to get done and I'm really pleased with it. Uh, and then I started thinking about the Goddess Quilt book and it was like, you know what, ultimately it's just a book. It's not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. No one's life depends on this book being great. Um, the photos will probably stand out more than the words on the page. I mean, I don't know about you, but a lot of times I buy a quilt book and I flip it through it and I just look at the pictures. I hardly ever read the words unless I'm actually wanting to really dive in and, and dig deeper. And I would say that's a little bit of a criticism of most quilt books are, are kind of written very dry and very step-by-step um, -step formulaic. There's very little emotion there to draw you in. That's, sorry, I don't mean to sound critical. I'm very sorry if that came across as critical, but that's just something I picked up. And that's something that I've tried to improve with my writing you know, like uh, in Explore Walking Foot Quilting with Leah Day, I talk about, you know, how, um, it, you know, listening to advice is like listening to, you know, for quilting is kind of like listening to advice when you go on an African safari and they tell you to keep your arms in and wear bug spray so you don't get eaten alive by mosquitoes and you don't get your arms ripped off by the wild animals. <laughs> so that's, you know, one of those funny things that I wrote in that book just to keep it from going too dry and step by step you know, and, and, and non-fiction-y. Uh, and I, I'm planning the same thing for the Goddess Quilt book, but still ultimately it's going to be a pretty book filled with pretty pictures. I probably should do more uh, agonizing about the pictures being perfect than I should necessarily about the text being perfect, absolutely perfect. So that really helped, you know, looking at it from just the, hey, is the world going to end if this is not absolutely perfect? No. Uh, and then two, it, it, it's just, I think it's good to just take it down a notch. It's not so crucial. You know, the, the double wedding ring quilt that I've wanted to make for years. I, I started one a couple years ago. I think this was around our 10 year anniversary. I started one and then I immediately stopped and put it away. Uh, and I think I might've even like trashed the fabric and used it for something else because my seams weren't matching up well. And that drove me so crazy. Uh, and I was 
you know, kind of, I was trying to use a template set and I really liked the templates, but then they, they weren't piecing accurately. And that was so frustrating that it wasn't going together the way I wanted it to. And the things weren't matching up well that I just said, you know, if it's not perfect, I don't want to make it and shut it down. And of course, I haven't made that double wedding ring quilt because of that. If it wasn't perfect, I wasn't willing to make it. And when I go at things with that mentality, it's never going to get done. When I go at it with the mentality that it's perfect or die, then the project usually dies. Because how can anyone make anything good enough if perfect is the standard? And at, you know, and sorry, what is perfect really when it comes to a quilt or quilt book? or anything creative. This is our best expression that we can put out there and that's it. And there's really nothing that we can judge it against or judge it to. I mean, sure, if it's filled with typos and ugly photos, that's one thing, <laughs> but that's not even gonna be the case. You know, I, 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 I've, I've gotten locked in place with this simply by my massive expectation built up over years of wanting to do this thing and not doing it. Uh, and I really had to take it down a notch and just say, it's just going to be a book, you know, really at the end of the day, it's just a book. I went to books a million and just walked through the aisles and it's just kind of absorbing that there are millions, if not billions of books already on shelves and that my book will be a drop in the bucket. It will be a single drop in the ocean. It is insignificant really, in the grand scheme of things. It is greatly insignificant. And I know that word insignificant might be bad, but I honestly feel like I need to put that on a t-shirt <laughs> because in the grand scheme of things, it is. It is insignificant and it's okay. Um, that If that is the word that is gonna free me up to make this possible and make it, you know, give me the space that I need, like the mental space and the emotional space that I need to make this thing and not be locked in place by my fears of making mistakes and it not being what people want or it not being what even I was satisfied with. I mean, that's a little bit of this too, is just feeling like I built this up so much that what if it, what if it doesn't even meet my expectations, right? So the word insignificant is really helping me. <laughs> And I think that's a good thing. You know, it's going back to what I was saying about just the reminder that, you know, we need to be reminded that we don't know everything and that there's still so much to learn. I don't care how long you've been quilting. I, and I'll be saying this even when I've been quilting for 40 years, there's so much to learn and there's so much to focus on. Even now, you know, at this stage, I've invented 500 plus designs on free motion quilting. I still feel like there's more designs out there and there's more stuff to learn and there's more stuff to share. And even I'm still figuring things out and learning as I go. So that's the thing I'm tapping into. And that is helping so much with releasing the fear that was stalling that project before it had even started. So I feel great. As you can see, my energy level is right back up again. Um, I did start taking an allergy pill <laughs> uh, just simply because uh, my allergies were just really, really activated this month and that really started helping and making me feel better. So uh, I'd say check in on health if you're not feeling well, uh, if that actually is the culprit. If it's not, then if you're feeling stuck on something, you know, give yourself permission to just write about it and write out all your thoughts and get it all out in stream of consciousness so you can identify what that thought is, what, what's, you know, bogging you down and getting you stuck in place compare it to other projects and laugh at yourself if you realize that you would rather go piece a jelly roll quilt, you know, of somebody else's design fabric rather than making that special, special quilt or that special project that you have been putting off for years. Which one is more important? Hello? <laughs> I think you can answer that, right? So I think checking in and identifying that fear, confronting it, and not letting it keep you stuck. That's the lesson that I'm taking today, and that's what I'm running with, and I cannot wait to get back to writing tomorrow morning. So I hope that you've enjoyed this podcast episode about rising to the challenge of your fears. If you'd like to find more podcast episodes, you can check them all out at leoday.com slash podcast. 
And don't forget to join our Quilt Friends Club if you like to participate in the How Do I Quilt This series and get advice on quilting your quilts once a month and also make friends around the world and share pretty pictures of your quilts too. I love that, it's all good. So come and check out our Quilt Friends Club at quiltfriends.club and become my very best quilting friend. Until next time, let's go quilt.